Christ. Remember our mission statement. We talk about the countless number of families who feel like this town has forgotten them. I got the opinion that there's some members of the Freedom Caucus, they'd vote no against the Ten Commandments if it came up for a vote. I don't think we've seen the end of health care. The further along we go, where premiums continue to go up, more and more people will be drawn into this discussion. Next up, we're going to get back to the president's three-part agenda. Jobs, jobs, and jobs. You need 60 votes in the Senate to do anything, including a bathroom break. I would recommend they, they pivot to infrastructure now. Oh boy, let's bring in our panel. Steve Hayes, editor-in-chief of the Weekly Standard. Charles Lane, opinion writer for the Washington Post. Molly Hemingway, senior editor at The Federalist and syndicated columnist Charles Krauthammer. Welcome to all of you. There's a lot going on in Washington. All right, Steve, you heard a lot of different topics touched on there. I want to bring up something, though. Uh, there was a tweet from the president this weekend. This is from the real Donald Trump. Uh, account. Democrats are smiling in D.C. that the Freedom Caucus, with the help of Club for Growth and Heritage, have saved Planned Parenthood and Obamacare. Now, if they're going to get to the rest of this agenda and all the other things they have to do, they got to kiss and make up at some point. Yeah, I mean, what we've seen in fits and starts from virtually everybody involved is taking shots at one another and then making up or trying to make nice, while a lot of that taking place behind the scenes. Look, I mean, I think if you're looking uh, for who to blame on what happened, the answer is everyone. I mean, the answer is the president, the answer is the House leadership, the answer is the Freedom Caucus. Now, I happen to be very sympathetic to the, the substantive arguments that the Freedom Caucus made, and I share their disappointment that the original bill wasn't m more free market and didn't push more aggressively aggressively toward the kind of uh, real reforms I think that we need in our health care system. But sure, certainly it's the case that if Republicans don't, A, decide to make up and work together, and B, get health care back on the agenda, it will be a, a broken promise from Republicans of historic proportions. Uh, and Chuck, Sean Spicer, among many others, Ryan's Priebus and others have said, it's not gone away. There are a number of members of the Freedom Caucus, too, saying this health care fight is not over. It's going to come back at some point. But they're barreling forward with other things like tax reform that they want to get done as well. Where do you think health care re-bubbles up to the surface, does it? Well, I thought Paul Ryan just said it's here for the foreseeable future. So, once again, it's not even clear that everybody has the same sense of reality in this party. I don't think there's ever been a time in our history where there's been one party that was simultaneously totally dominant in American politics and totally incoherent within itself. And no, I don't expect, maybe there's some talk about like revisiting health care and this and that. I don't really expect that. I think I, maybe wrongly, but I think rightly, I expect them to pivot to tax reform and, and try and make a run at that. And when they do, they're going to have to be much more deliberate and much more careful about, you know, before they launch some bill, make sure that they've really got everybody on side. The problem, of course, is the Freedom Caucus, as Mr. Poe said, they might vote against <laughs> anything, even the Ten Commandments. Well, and that, that's why, Molly, I want to play a little bit um, from the chair of the Freedom Caucus, Mark Meadows, who was talking this weekend about this idea of tax reform, because a lot of people think they're going to be hardliners, it's going to be tough to get them on board. But here's what he said about making this revenue neutral or not. Tax reform and lowering taxes, uh, you know, will create and generate more income. And so we're looking at those where the fine balance is, but uh, does it have to be fully offset? Uh, my personal response is, is no. So he's not speaking for the caucus there, but he sounds like they're not going to be as, you know, line drawn in the sand and that's it and we're not coming across. Well, it is interesting. They said that the whole reason you had to do health care originally was so that you would get these budget savings that you could then apply to tax reform. And now they're just going ahead with tax reform. Although, you know, to be fair, you can work it either way. And there are so many gains to be made through tax reform that maybe he just wants to focus on that. Having said that, you know, there really is an issue of health reform needs to happen. They might say they're done with health care reform, insurance reform, but it's certainly not done, well, done with them. And this legislation really is a failure and insurance companies will continue to leave and millions of people will continue to suffer. So whether or not they want to be done with it, it has to be dealt with. Well, Charles, how do you see that playing out in 2018, this inability of the GOP controlling the White House, Senate and House and promising for seven years and running against this on a repeal? Uh, if it, you know, if they don't do anything beyond what happened on Friday, what happens when 2018 rolls around? And if by very their prediction is the system under Obamacare is that much worse and Americans are in even worse shape. I think it's ruinous. It's not just a promise betrayed. It's a complete inability to govern, particularly when you've been arguing for something for seven years. It arrives and you are then unprepared. So that's why I think it has to come back. 
And I think the time it comes back is in the fall when you get the new numbers, the new premiums coming out. They're going to be much higher, they're going to be fewer choices, far more. Insurers are going to be withdrawing from the exchanges and they are going to be in a state of collapse. At that point, I think that there'll be an opportunity. And I think what they have to do, here's the irony. I think among the Republicans in the House, including the Freedom Caucus, there would have been a general consensus on what we would want to do. But the leadership decided to tailor the legislation to fit the niceties of the reconciliation rules in the Senate. That makes no sense at all. Put everything in the bill, including what's called the phase three stuff that was supposed to come later. The stuff that the conservatives want, that everybody really wants, including tort reform, including stripping out the uh, coverage requirements, which are largely irrational. Put all that in the bill, and if it turns out that in the Senate it needs 60, well, it'll be the Democrats who have to filibuster and let the country watch them deny them a reform of a collapsing system. That seems to me the logical way to go. You may have to wait till the fall, but that's what they ought to do. All right, I want to make sure that we get, uh, we touch on the issue with the House Intelligence Chairman Devin Nunes as well, with the revelation today that he apparently went to the White House to see whatever the sourcing was uh, from the documents that he is referencing. I want to play a little bit of what uh, Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer had to say. His actions look like those of someone who is interested in protecting the president and his party, and that doesn't work when the goal of the committee is to investigate Russia and its connection to the president and his campaign. Here's a bit of what a spokesperson for uh, Congressman or Chairman Nunes said. He said he met with his source at the White House grounds in order to have proximity to a secure location where he could view the information provided by the source. Because of classification rules, the source could not simply put the documents in a backpack, walk them over to the House Intelligence Committee space. The White House grounds was the best location to safeguard the proper chain of custody and classification of those documents so the chairman could view them in a legal way. Molly. Exactly. Uh, Representative Nunez explained that there was no place on Capitol Hill where he could view these documents. He had to view them in an executive branch computer. It sounds like he has a whistleblower who's actually trying to follow through what the proper rules are for getting this information. The other interesting thing that Nunez said today is that this information wasn't just widely disseminated to intelligence agencies, but back to the Obama White House. If that's true, we have further evidence that we have the makings of a big scandal, one that needs investigation, not just the probe with Russia, but how much the Obama administration was surveilling Trump and his uh, associates. Well, Chuck, you know that the Democrats are going to make hay of this and point to, hey, it's coming from inside the White House. What was it? Who was he seeing? Already, they're, they're you know, really tackling the PR side of this. But let us assume that Devin Nunes had to look at these in the White House. It was the only secure place. The problem is still that once he got this information, his first move was to go tell the president, was to go over to the White House and talk about it with Donald Trump as opposed to, I don't know, the members of his committee. First he told the press, actually. He told the American people. Take first. your pick. I mean, he's supposedly running a serious investigation of intelligence matters. And I, I think the damage, what, what you read this talk about like it was the only proper place is just damage control. The damage is significant. Nunes has, has a reputation, a well-deserved reputation of being sort of a dog with a bone on intelligence issues. And in a couple of previous um, issues, it's worked to the advantage, I think, of the country. He's, he's exposed things on Benghazi that we never would have seen but for his work. The same is true with the Osama bin Laden documents. The question here is, is what are the documents? I mean, what does he have? I just don't think we know enough about what he has to draw any firm conclusions about whether it is or is not, you know, whether this is the scandal that uh, Molly suggested is or whether it's, you know, the, the scandal that Democrats suggested is. I think we need to learn a lot more before we can draw firm conclusions. All right. So we'll have to stay tuned.